Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us for tonight's panel on the topic of least restrictive environment, or LRE. My name is Lori Peters, and I am joined here by my colleagues. Hello, my name is Shapika. Hi, I'm Tori. Good evening, my name is Joshua. The four of us are students in the master's program in deaf education at Texas Women's University. And tonight we're holding this panel to discuss a topic near and dear to us, the topic of LRE, least restrictive environment. We will be discussing the tough questions and the reality of LRE and how it affects deaf children. I will start out our discussion with the panel by asking what does the restriction environment mean? Lori, do you have any thoughts? Yes, Shafika. So most educators think of LRE as a continuum where the general education classroom is perceived as the least restrictive environment whereas a specialized school is most restrictive. With general education public school with supports, that's somewhere in the middle. However, I would say that the least restrictive environment is really not crystal clear, especially when it comes to application with deaf and hard of hearing students. Yeah, so this law was written back in 1975. It was called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. It required that all children with disabilities be provided with a free appropriate public education or FAPE in a least restrictive environment. This is great for hearing students with disabilities, yes, but not so great for deaf and hard of hearing students. It's kind of a one size fits all that really doesn't apply to some of our kids, some of our deaf and hard of hearing students. So they need access to language of instruction and accessible language models. So in 1990, IDEA further clarified that LRE means it enables children with disabilities to be educated with non-disabled children to the quote, maximum extent appropriate. But this creates a reality in which many deaf and hard of hearing children are the only deaf kid in their entire school. And for those who use ASL or another sign communication, it means they probably have no peers to communicate with. And just to add to that, in 1985, the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services stated that initial placement must be in the school that's closest to that child's home. And removal of a child from their first placement is only allowed after that student has showed evidence that it's a harmful placement. So that means that we are waiting for our students to be harmed before we intervene. Is that really the best practice? There have been so many detrimental effects on learning outcomes as a result of these interpretations of LRE. So each district has their own way of interpreting and implementing LRE, and that can cause havoc and cause a lot of inappropriate placements for a lot of students. In fact, um, a book called A Journey Into the Deaf World, um, one deaf adult says, the laws that were created to protect those with disabilities really carry with them conflicts for the deaf child who wishes to obtain a quality education. 
And these conflicts are grounded in issues of language and culture that really mark the interface between the deaf world and the hearing world. So are you saying that amazing education is never appropriate for deaf and hardy hearing child? No, 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 of course not. We should reiterate for clarification that we're talking about the experiences of deaf and hard of hearing children who would benefit from increased access to signed communication. It's visual. So now I'd like to introduce our next topic. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more about this continuum or spectrum of placement options for deaf and for, I'm sorry, for students with disabilities, including hearing differences. I would love to start this off. Let's look at a picture that shows the traditional idea of the placement continuum. A mainstream classroom is kind of the equivalent to the general education classroom. The students in a general education classroom with a general education teacher all day might have an interpreter or assistive listening technology. This is generally considered to be labeled the least restrictive environment because most of it is like the traditional kind of general education. Then we have in class the pool or construction. This means the child is with the general education teacher in a general education classroom almost all day, every day. But they never received teaching in class the pool from a specialized teacher of the deaf or special education teacher. This is considered to be a more depth, depth more reputation than 100 general education experience because they're depicting. Right. And then next, we have special education classes. So if a child is in a general education classroom for most of the day, but in a contained classroom for part of the day, which in our case, typically deaf and hard of hearing students are inside of a specifically deaf classroom, but that is considered to be a, a less restrictive placement than that of a child who is inside of a special education classroom all day. And this is because the value is being placed on students being inside of a normal classroom with a normal teacher. And the less time inside of a gen ed classroom, the more restrictive that that placement is labeled using that, you know, traditional view of LRE. So what about like regional day schools for the deaf? or state schools for the deaf. In these programs, students receive special education services 100% of the time. And all of their classmates are also receiving special education services. And they are served by teachers with the qualifications and the training to work with that specific student population. In our case, certified teachers for the deaf. This might sound like a perfect placement for these students, but these are considered to be the most restrictive using the traditional perspective of LRE. Five labor is the specialized group as most restriction. We are making it harder and harder for students who need to stay be offered at the specialized school from getting them. A large number of deaf and hard of hearing youth America sign language will be greatly benefited from it, and they also got the chance to thrive in their language. 
specialized group that operates with the bilingual model of ASL and English are often exactly what a child with the later access to spoken language needs. But oftentimes these students have an interpreter, right? Isn't the interpreter, isn't that good enough access to language? Well, an interpreter is better than nothing. It, it makes the curriculum available in a visual sign language. But there are many other aspects of a child's education that these children do not experience in this kind of setting. At a specialized school for the deaf, there are tons and tons of language models for these kids. They acquire language naturally by using it in various settings with classmates and with teachers who use their language. ASL, to me, it seems pretty restrictive to restrict students to a general education setting. They can't fully participate in the language of instruction, which is usually spoken English. So why are we labeling a language rich environment that allows our deaf and hard of hearing students to thrive as most restrictive? Why? Exactly. I mean, in a mainstream classroom, where a student uses an interpreter, it's likely that their interpreter is the only person who understands their language. Can you imagine the effects that that has on our students when they have no direct communication with their teachers or their classmates? They're essentially only directly communicating with one person at school each and every day, their interpreter. Whew, that is so much isolation. That can have a huge impact on students' self-esteem, their social emotional skills, and their identity. So in a mainstream classroom, deaf students have no choice but to try to get along in a hearing world. And that hearing world just simply does not operate with people like them in mind. It. There are benefits of mainstream though. I want to point out that specialized program might be far away from home. And some families may do not want to send their children far away. This was the LRE continuum to tell the wife, the wife for family to decide to keep their children close to the home in the general education study if they want to. And this is for some students who have more access to the hearing, make dream environment is more acceptable and be more beneficial to the child. Hey, great points, everyone. It's important to remember that this discussion does not mean that we're trying to say one placement is better than any other placement for all deaf and hard of hearing children. In fact, we want to say just the opposite. A, continue of a, a, a continuum of options should be offered to all families. But instead of defining least restrictive environment as you know, meaning the closest thing to a typical gen ed experience, gosh, we, we highly recommend the LRE be framed and seen as um, the place with the most access. For many deaf and hard of hearing students, the most accessible environment is not the general education classroom, but instead it's inside of a specialized school or a program for the deaf. So in these cases, isn't the specialized school that meets their language needs actually the least restrictive environment? And if a general education classroom doesn't provide that full access to language, doesn't that mean it's the most restrictive? It doesn't have access. Hey team, maybe our audience is not familiar with the difference between a 
state school for the deaf and specialized programs like an RDSPD or regional day school program. Would someone mind um, elaborating on like some really important comparisons between the two? Good point, Tori. So sometimes it's hard to remember that not everyone is familiar with the different kinds of school settings that we are. So in a residential school for the deaf, students have full access to visual communication in all areas of education, athletics, teachers, student life, and after school activities. An RDSPD, that is a deaf education program at a more centralized school district. So students inside of an RDSPD, they have classes taught by teachers that are trained to work with deaf students. There are many opportunities for social inclusion and interaction with other deaf and hard of hearing students there. We don't that if it resonated through the data of not many available life with the RDSPD or mainstream school. Here in Texas, we have one resident school and that in Austin. For the parents to send their children, they have to either live in local or the kids have to stay in dorm during the week. Similar to the body school, our DSPD program aren't always as local as the mainstream school either. A student might have to incur a long bus ride to the neighborhood district that has the DSPD program. It is more local than the resident school, but not as local as the neighborhood mainstream school. Right. So in an RDSPD, our deaf and hard of hearing students are around professionals that have more experience and training with deaf education. And they still have opportunities to be involved in non-academic activities like sports, clubs, stuff like that. But it's not always full communication ac uh, access in those activities. So students would learn how to, you know, access the hearing world but any involvement with additional activities, that comes with communication barriers. So if a student wanted to join an athletic team, they would need to request an interpreter for all of their practices and all of their games in order to maintain communication. And you know that's not happening a lot of the times. Whereas in a residential school, students would have full access to communication without barriers. But how do parents just place their kids in their desired setting? They just fill out some paperwork and send it off and it's done, right? That's a good question, Tori. So really because of the 1985 Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services, they stated that students must be placed in the school closest to their home first. And they have to start at the school that they would have been zoned to. Then once they've been failing and evidence is provided that shows that the environment is harmful for the child, then the IEP team can meet and discuss a different placement either an RDSPD or a residential school. But with LRE, the goal is to keep students in a setting that allows them to be educated with non-disabled peers as often as possible. So let's look at how many options parents have with their child's education. So here in Texas, we have one resident school for the deaf student in Austin. In a DFW stand for Dallas Forward area, along has 13 RDSPD 
in the same area for a data forward area, there are over 300 public schools. For students to move to another school, their home district had to pay the district the train for issue. That means this also becomes the financial dilemma for school district. How does this impact our job as a topic in a deaf education? Yeah, so that's a really important question, Shay. So our educators and our SLPs need to be looking at students and their needs individually. It's also our responsibilities to know the pros and cons of each possible setting that our students could be in and how that could you know, impact them and their needs. It's so important that the IEP team members look at each student as an individual. Right, JC. And in a perfect world, all IEP teams already are doing that. But in a truly perfect world, it would be easier for parents to just go ahead and enroll their child in an RDSPD or a residential school for the deaf. And we would already see a higher enrollment rate in those RDSPD and state, state schools. It could also be beneficial if we had an amendment or clarification of what least restrictive environment really means and also free appropriate public education, what that really means related to deaf and hard of hearing students. We could adopt the model in model youth in Canada first Mason School, where students are provided with a deep closer education. Yeah, I mean really all of those are possible, you know, everything you mentioned is possible solutions. And one thing that we can do immediately is that we need to stop focusing on the label of disabled that are deaf and hard of hearing students. Have, they need communication access. They don't need this label of disability. Those are great points, everyone. While the world might not be perfect, we can all work to do our best in the current world that we have. I wanna say thank you for joining us today. We hope you gained a more deep understanding of the impact of LRE and how it relates with the education of our deaf and hard of hearing students. Thanks. Bye.